Hello everyone, I am the Lore Explorer, and this video will contain spoilers for Outer Wilds. Recently, I saw a thumbnail of a video posted by Any Austin where they were talking about the rivers of Skyrim. And although I didn't watch the video, it had me thinking about Timber Hearth and its waterways, and how these complex waterways are actually a pretty solid representation of real life. So in today's loop, I want to talk about how these waterways can help us understand why Timber Hearth is the ideal environment for evolution, and how it could realistically lead to the evolution of Hearthians. To start, we're just going to do a quick walkthrough of the unique water features on Timber Hearth. We might as well begin at the highest point where water flows in the game. On the equator of Timber Hearth, we find a series of geysers that shoot water out of them at a pretty high velocity. Getting launched by one of these geysers actually takes us all the way to space, so we know that these geysers are under tons of pressure. The water that gets shot up by these geysers disperses really quickly, and the water spreads out in a tiny droplets. But because these droplets are entering space and getting high in the atmosphere, it's very likely that most of these droplets freeze and fall back onto the planet as little snowflakes. We see this snow building up on top of the geysers, leaving a nice snow-capped mountain of sorts. But what's attached to most of these mountains are one of my favorite water features that we see. What we see on the small geysers are little rock pools. These rock pools collect all the water that's melting from the mountaintop and it begins flowing down the mountain. The only way these pools ever really lose water is by being disturbed or becoming full. So as the water melts and begins to fill the pools, they keep trickling down slowly into the next set of rock pools, and this continues all the way down through the chain of pools further down on the mountain as they all begin to fill. I find it cool that the planet is essentially a natural fountain of sorts. The water falls down, gets slowed down in these pools, which all eventually fills until it reaches the bottom of the geysers again, and then internal heat from the planet eventually creates the pressure necessary to launch the water right back up to the top of the fountain. But before it can do that, the water actually has a long path it needs to take. Once all of these pools are full, they have nowhere else to go but to spill onto the surface of Timber Hearth. In the case of the giant geyser, this forms multiple waterfalls, and the water sort of falls to a naturally low area where the water pools. It's sort of difficult or suspect to see where this water drains to, or why the water levels don't continue to rise here. But, in the case of the smaller geysers, we see something pretty cool. The water that reaches the bottom of these pools eventually feeds into a vast river or stream system. And looking around, we find that these waterways are present on the majority of Timber Hearth's surface. In fact, we can follow these streams all the way back to the Hearthian village as the water naturally tries to move to the lower ground. Craters are very low ground, and the water essentially rushes into them. This is why we find the giant waterfalls in the Hearthian village. All of this water is streaming directly down from the geysers, but the water doesn't stop here. Thankfully, all the water filling the crater that the village is in actually has an outlet that prevents this waterfall from filling the crater up entirely. It seems as though the waterfall and small geysers have left pathways for the water to just flow through the city and drain even deeper into the planet. Following this water consists of jumping down a waterfall or into one of the geysers in the Harthian village. In doing so, we find hollow areas of Timber Hearth where this water seems to gather. The core of the planet makes it so that the water can't penetrate the rock layer of Earth to go any deeper. These cavities were likely created by tidal heating, geothermal activity, and just the water eroding away at it from falling for so long. But luckily, it has a cavity to fill, and so this is about as low as we can follow the water. Thankfully, Timber Hearth seems to have a ton of internal heat, likely due to tidal heating from larger planets and the sun's very active period. As this underground space fills up with water, the geothermal vents heat up the rocks and water around it. The water begins to expand as it gets hotter and hotter, until eventually it expands so much into the small space that the underground just fills and kind of overfills really and this puts immense pressure on the rock and water down here and this is the pressure that drives the entire hydrology of the planet as the water heats up from the geothermal vents and the pressure grows too much the water starts being ejected up through the geysers this means that there's so much pressure that it was able to burst the top layer of rock that we find in the tiny lake though i think this only serves to briefly relieve the pressure down there after it builds up Looking around the cave, we can find the second way of pressure relief for this system. What looks like tunnels can be found essentially throughout the entire planet as if they were veins carrying blood. 
or rather giant water slides carrying you throughout the entire planet. The holes and tunnels were likely burned out of the planet from lava pouring out of the core in thermal vents. This lava would cool and wash away over time, leaving these tunnels having burned through the ground. Similar structures can be found on Earth's moon, and when humans begin to visit the moon again, this time to stay, underground tunnels and caves that have been burned out through volcanoes are one of the places that humans hope to make habitable there. But here on Timber Hearth, these same tunnels are now filled with water. So this type of hydrosphere on a planet is absolutely something that we could find in the universe. In game, we can follow these tunnels as they lead us to a series of cavities that also have geysers attached to them. Every cavity that we find has geothermal vents beneath them powering this whole system. So it starts to make sense why there's so much pressure that repeatedly builds up underground that it makes these geysers all throughout the planet. And if we keep following this water through these tunnels, we make our way back to the beginning geyser where we started the video. Now, before I start talking about this next part of the video, I want to preface that I am no expert on evolution. However, I do see a semblance of my real-world understanding about the beginning of life here on Earth and the hundreds of millions of years of evolution it took for humans to evolve in the game, and I find that very interesting. From what I understand, geothermal vents are an excellent way to stir up particles and gases. As it vents and heats up the water and rock nearby, all types of different matter are being heated and mixed up together in a turbulent way. I'm pretty sure complex interactions within these waters are what led to the most basic life forms on Earth. But just as the beginning of life needed heat and turbulence to get started, it also needed peace and cooler temperatures to evolve. From what I remember, the rock pools on the geysers are also a very important step in life and evolution. In these isolated rock pools, whatever may be living or evolving here is sort of separated from other life forms. They're finally introduced to the sun and its many benefits in its many forms of energy, and even a visible light spectrum aspect beyond the warm glow of the geothermal vents. But what's particularly excellent for life is that every rock pole is a different little microcosm. Each one has a unique mix of material, temperature, direct sunlight, and other important variables. These rock pools are the perfect environment for life to rapidly evolve and sort of explode in a variety of different ways, like life did here on Earth. Eventually, even the life found in the rock pools would be moved around as it's pushed further and further down the geyser, until it finds itself in a fierce flowing river instead of their secluded, peaceful rock ponds. Now, once out of their metaphorical nursery of the rock pools, life again finds itself in a new environment with many new things that it needs to adapt to in order to survive. Even the river is a very important step, as I imagine life has to get stronger and bigger here to contend with the currents as well as compete with other life forms. Of course, we find lakes and groves and whatnot all throughout the planet, but I think the Harthians chose to found their village in the crater because this is what they were served up in life. This is the only way I can put it. We find the Nomai mural which depicts the Nomai discovering a fish species in one of the earlier mining prospects. They seem to have discovered an aquatic species that was just evolving legs and the ability to walk on land. And I think it's likely that their predecessors didn't have legs yet, but as the river fed them into a lake and they found themselves in a new environment, I think this is where they sort of forked off into their own species. Being fed by the current into their own little lake that's isolated from the entire water system, they had no choice but to adapt to the new place and kind of grow legs to get out of their confinements. Imagine these fish having fallen from the waterfall and being stuck underground, then them having being ejected up, or even just flowed right down from the river into this pond in the middle of the village. They would have no choice but to grow legs and walk out. They're, I mean, the resources are not infinite there. They would have to evolve. Even if they grew legs and the ability to walk around, they still wouldn't be able to get out of the crater yet. They would have to just kind of settle down and start living. So that's what I kind of mean by that's what they were served up in life. But however it happened, it is incredible that they depicted this evolution of a species that ended up not only thriving on the surface of Timber Hearth, 
but they can be found on every single planet in the entire solar system. Not to mention that it spawned one of the best explorers in the entire universe because they were the ones that made it to the eye of the universe. But with that, I think I've probably talked enough about the water and my half-witted understanding of evolution, and I genuinely hoped you found this video just about as interesting as I found it. If you didn't, that's okay too. If you did though, consider subscribing to the channel, as I do have some future plans for the channel, even though it's kind of quiet. But as usual, a special thank you to the members here on the channel. I genuinely appreciate the support, especially after all the crazy stuff that happened with that weird crypto scam being run on my channel, but thankfully I got it back and we're just going to leave that in the past. But mostly, I just want to thank you for being here with me. This is the Lore Explorer, diving deep into the game so you don't have to. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you in the next video.